G'day guys, uh, just gonna go through a rundown of all the different things that you can check on your car yourself in between doing your servicing, your regular servicing to maintain your car and make sure it's gonna be operational on the road and safe for you. So a couple of things we're gonna go through is checking the oil in your engine, tire pressures, checking your lights and a couple of other fluids inside your engine bay. Uh, and these are things you can check on any car. It doesn't have to be a Triton, it can be whatever you're driving and I'll try and give you the best description that's gonna help you understand where it's gonna be found and also um, what it is that you need to be looking for on your vehicle and how to actually do the, the test check correctly. Some of these checks may require you to need another person. Uh, things like when you're checking the brake light, obviously you can't be pressing the pedal and seeing the back of the car at the same time, so you might need to go and get your mum or your girlfriend to go and help you. Right, so first of all, you need to locate where the uh, bonnet release is in your particular vehicle. Some vehicles are on the left-hand side in the footwell, some are on the driver's side in the footwell, and this one is just in the kick panel. Just come around here and we'll show you. So just there is where the release is on this vehicle. Some you'll find are here, some are further across under here, and some are on the other side in the other footwell. Now we'll just go to the engine bay and pop that. So your most bonnets, nearly all bonnets, especially for Australian standards, will have a secondary release. If we look down just under here, follow that along and you'll find a little extra release, release and you can see that releasing just here to let the bonnet come up. If I try and lift it without pulling that up, it won't lift. That allows it to lift the bonnet up. Find your bonnet stand, hold it up, put it in the correct position so it's secure and you're not gonna get injured from your bonnet falling on your head or on your back when you're look, looking underneath the uh, engine bay. Right, now, checking the engine oil. Make sure you've got a rag. Check that your car is out of gear. Some cars require to have the clutch in when you start. Start it. If you have an oil pressure gauge in your car, wait till that comes up into the pressure or the pressure light or oil light in your engine bay, uh, in your engine will show up on your dash. Once that's gone out and you've had your engine running for a little bit, turn it off. Let it uh, sit for about 15, 20 seconds. That lets the oil that's been pushed up inside the engine everywhere to run back down to the sump. And then we can check that the oil is correct in the sump with the dipstick. Right, so in this vehicle, uh, it's on the right hand side. Every vehicle is different. So make sure you know where this is. If you don't know where this is, you'll find it in your owner's manual of where it's located. But when you pull it out, put your rag down at the top of the tube of the dipstick. Pull your dipstick all the way out and wipe it clean as it comes out. Uh, while the engine's running, what you'll find, if you just pull that out without wiping it, the oil will be splashed all the way up through past the dipstick everywhere, and you won't get an accurate reading. So you've got to wipe it first, dip it in, make sure your car's on flat ground as well when you do this. If you're on a hill, the oil's gonna to run to one end of the sump or the other, and not give you an accurate reading of what your level's supposed to be. So when you pull it out, Make sure you're catching any drips and you check where along that dipstick that you can see the oil oil line. Here you can see that it's just above the full mark, so this is the correct amount. It is slightly overfilled for this vehicle. Overfilled for this vehicle. Okay, while we're under here, let's have a look at what else we can visually check ourselves. Um, for the next one, I'm gonna go and get my light and then show you the belt tension and what you need to look for on the belts in the engine bay. Okay, so just a visual inspection of the fan belts. Um, what you're looking for is any of these little ribs along here when you have a look at it. Uh, you don't have to twist the top one. If you can't reach it, you can look down through the engine bay and see an area where you can actually see the top of the belt like there. Um, what you're looking for is any perish cracks through the rubber. We haven't got any on this vehicle um, as a demo to show you. So this has actually got quite good belts on it. Another thing to check is the actual deflection or stretch, how tight the tension is of the belt. That sort of amount of movement, it feels firm like, but it's not too firm that it's like rock hard. Um, check the rest of the belts. That one down there's got a little tiny bit of excessive movement for that short of a gap. Always remember that the closer the pulleys are together, the less the rubber, the belt will move. If they're further apart, you're gonna have more ability to make it move. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're checking the tensions. 
to make sure that they're tight. And if you're mechanically minded, you can get in there and have a go at tightening them yourself. But if you've got belt squeal in your car, I recommend going to a mechanic if you don't know how to do it yourself. Right, now, other things we can look for. One thing I've noticed straight away looking in here, see this shiny black stuff in here? That there is oil residue from the engine or from a component. Now, right above that, this part here is the power steering pump. There's a chance that power steering pump is actually leaking down through the front of this motor. That's something that needs to be rectified by a mechanic or replace the power steering pump yourself if it is that. Don't go and replace any parts uh, just because it looks like there's oil around it either. Degrease the area and then run your car and make sure that that spot is exactly where that oil is coming from. The other thing to note here is right above where the power steering pump is, is the oil fill. So where you fill up and top up your oil, if someone's spilt oil, which it looks like they have here, uh, that could be the reason it's oily down straight underneath this area as well. So always double check to make sure that the component you think is leaking, it may not be that at all. Uh, right, other things we can check. Power steering fluid. Look for your power steering fluid reservoir. Usually it will tell you on the cap that it is power steering. If you read that there, it actually says power steering fluid. Make sure that uh, it is that. And when you inspect it, check the level. It will have a minimum and maximum on it. It is right on the minimum on this by the look of it. Let's just wipe that and do another dip. And yeah, it's on the minimum at the bottom of the maximum. Well, it's halfway up the minimum, but the bottom of the maximum by the look of it. So that's all right. And the, by the color, I reckon it's all right. If you smell your power steering fluid, uh, there's a very, very distinct smell with uh, transmission fluid, which is power steering fluid, when it's clean and also when it's burnt. When it's burnt, it's gonna have carbon in it. If you have carbon in it, it will have a blacker color, not a really bright red color. Um, and also it'll be more of a brown. Um, and also the carbon that builds up in there when your um, fluid gets old, that is very, very sharp, brittle sort of um, stuff. If you look under a microscope, that carbon in there is sharp and will wear out all your seals in your steering rack or your steering box, and then cause your steering box or your power steering pump to start leaking. So it's recommended to replace your power steering fluid on a regular basis, uh, probably once every two or three years and it all depends on how much you use your car and how much you drive as well. Okay, on to brake fluid. Brake fluid is always gonna be right, well, not always, but usually right in front of where the driver's uh, pedals are. So this one's your brake fluid. Unscrew the lid or just lift it off, depending on what type of vehicle you've got. Some unscrew, some just lift. And that's at an acceptable level when you look at the side here. It's got max written right there, and that's actually at the max line now. So that's not too bad, that level. And also your clutch fluid. If you've got a manual vehicle, your clutch fluid needs to be checked as well as your brake fluid. Some vehicles that are manual will share the brake fluid reservoir with the clutch fluid and you only need to check the one obviously, don't go looking for the second one, but it'll be pretty obvious from your reservoir, you'll have a hose going across to where your clutch master cylinder is. Okay, now, other things we can check in the engine bay is coolant. So, let's go through where you can check your coolant. If your engine hasn't been driving and it's not hot, this one's a bit warm, so don't open the radiator cap if it's hot. Over here is what we call our reservoir or the overflow bottle. Now, what that does is basically you should have coolant in there. If you can shine the light on that. It's in between the full and the low mark. We won't touch that because as this engine cools down, um, it will suck more coolant out of that, but then when it gets hot, it'll push more coolant into it, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, let's do that up, and we will check Stephen's radiator. We may have a little tiny bit of fluid coming out of here. No, no pressure there, which is good, so it's not hot enough to be concerned about. Um, couple of things to check when you take your radiator cap off. If you have a radiator cap like this, there's a few things you should look at. Uh, the actual rubber on the top of your radiator cap, let's just turn that light off and sit that there. 
Um, this rubber here should be nice and pliable and soft. This one's actually starting to feel hard and feeling like it needs to be replaced. The reason being is, um, if that's not soft and pliable, the pressure in your radiator can't do its job. What happens is with a radiator cap, it's a very, very important part of your coolant system. It's probably one of the most important parts because it holds a higher pressure inside your coolant system, raising the boiling uh, point of the liquid in there. So by doing that, it's basically got a spring pressure here that when the coolant heats up, it'll heat up to a point that it starts pushing pressure against it and it can't push pressure against that until it hits about 13 PSI pressure inside the radiator. Uh, depending on what type of cap you've got, if this one's a 0.9 of a bar, I think that means, which is about 13 PSI, um, that will push pressure, uh, build up pressure inside there and raise your boiling temperature from 100 degrees to about 115 degrees before it'll actually start boiling. When it builds up that pressure, it'll push some fluid out. So it'll push that a tiny little bit then push fluid out of here over to your overflow bottle and it'll keep doing that until it gets to an equalized pressure and an equalized level inside the uh, coolant system and while you're driving along it'll happily sit at 100 110 no worries at all without boiling usually most cars try and sit around about 95 to 100 um, some vehicles will go up to about 104 to 110 if more modern vehicles the hotter they get so with this, I would personally, if I was servicing this vehicle, I would replace that radiator cap um, simply because with that swelling, it's actually got bigger than this silver piece. So when that's in there and it's pushed the coolant out over to here and it's heated up, you stop car, uh, the car and stop driving. When the coolant cools back down, it shrinks. So it's got to suck fluid back in. Instead of sucking air back in, it's attached to this hose coming from there and it gets to this little piece here and that bypass piece allows fluid to come in behind this silver cap and go in to the radiator through there and return into the coolant system now if this rubber gets too brittle and hard it doesn't actually allow it to get back past and inside so then you end up having a vacuum system uh, situation inside your radiator where these hoses will shrink down they'll suck down and uh, cause an issue with either air getting into inside your engine and possibly causing an overheating issue. Um, and I've also seen cars, we've actually replaced an engine here, um, simply because they hadn't replaced the radiator cap, it overheated and damaged the engine. So we had to replace the engine uh, with a second hand one, all because of a $15 cap that you can get from Repco. So make sure your radiator cap's in good order and your level in your radiator is up to the top. Um, Another thing to note too is just because your coolant has got colour, green, red, whatever colours in your car, uh, doesn't mean that it's up to spec. So if you aren't getting your car serviced regularly by a mechanic, you should be testing your coolant system yourself with a dip tester that you can buy from an auto shop. Um, those dip testers basically have a gauge on the side of it and it's just lit litmus paper and it tests the alkalinity inside your coolant uh, itself and that lets you know if it's got a higher boiling point or a lower freeze point um, so you don't damage your engine as well if depending on where you live and how cold or hot it gets um, right other things to check in your engine bay is washer fluid make sure that that's up to the top last thing you want to do is have a uh, muddy road or something you drive down a whole heap of bees might hit your windscreen whatever and you're not able to wash it off you turn your wipers on go to put your squirters on and nothing happens but you smear all the bugs across your windscreen and then you can't see any crash. So make sure you t keep that topped up, it's very important. I think that's about it for fluids that you would check at home yourself. Uh, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's get on to checking the lights. Okay, let's go through the lights. Uh, first of all, make sure that your ignition is the on position because some indicators will not work with the uh, key off. This is a perfect example. So check your right indicator, then your left indicator, make sure you're checking the front and the rear. Uh, then check your park lights. When you check your park lights, you need to go to the front. Either side, you should have a park light activated. And also on the rear, your two red lights, as well as your two number plate lights need to be working. If you don't have all of them working, uh, you need to rectify that and change a globe. And then you've got your low beam on the front and also high beam. 
if you've got a four wheel drive with fog lights, you should have a separate switch somewhere for the fog lights to come on uh, or the high beam uh, floodlights. Don't ever have your floodlights independently wired separate from having your high beams on because that is illegal. Okay, the other thing you need to check with your, uh, with your tail lights is your reverse. If you have a reverse camera, it's a good idea to check that that's operational as well when you do put it into reverse. And then lastly, you just need to check your brake lights. So put your foot on the brake. You will need someone else when you do the foot brake. You will need someone else to be checking the brakes uh, behind you to test that. Otherwise, you can check all this by just coming to the, to the car, put your parks on, walk around, put your low beam on, check it, put your high beam on, check that, and you can do that by yourself. The only thing you can't do unless you've got maybe a block of wood between your seat and the pedal um, is check your brake lights. So let's go and make sure those globes are all working. So just hop out, park lights working, park, park lights working. I'll walk to the back. Left park light, right park light's correct. Number plate lights are both working. I usually just put my hand under there and you can see that it's lighting up on your hand. Low beam. They're both working. And high beam while you're standing there with the camera still, can you just check if they're working please? All good. All good. Wait. Right indicator. Right. Left indicator. Left. You want to go to the rear and check for me? Thank you, mate. It's really handy having a second person here to do it for you. Right indicator. Right. Left indicator. Left. Right there. Right lights. All good. All working. And reverse. Reverse lights, both working. Awesome. Cool. So let's check all the lights to make sure that you can see where you're going at night and also that everyone else on the road is aware of where you're indicating to and if you're stopping. So make sure they're all working. Last thing you want to do is have a rear end accident because you didn't check your brake lights once a month. It's amazing how quickly a car can go from being roadworthy to unroadworthy, even after it leaves the shop after a service. You might have brake lights in your car that are five, 10 years old and we check them here on a service um, they're all good the day it leaves. A week later, two of them might blow and you have no idea um, until someone rear ends you. Right, now I'll pop in here with me saw. Just come in. Another thing to check on a regular basis is that one, your squirters for your windscreen squirt and wash your windscreen. And also that your windscreen wipers are wiping the windscreen clean and they're not leaving a mess behind. So you can see through your windscreen clearly. Nothing worse than uh, being like caught in the middle of a rainstorm, turn your wipers on and you can't see and you have to pull over. So that's a good one to check and something that you can change yourself just by buying them from Repco or Super Cheap or somewhere like that. We, oh, one other thing. One other thing, let's go and check tire pressures. Okay, now every vehicle is gonna be different for what tire pressure it requires and what's recommended. So most cars will have a tire pressure placard this one has got one right here. Just read through it. It's pretty self-explanatory of what you are gonna be doing with the vehicle, what pressures you need, if you're gonna be loaded, unloaded, etc., etc., and set your tire pressures to what's required there. One thing to note is some vehicles have, uh, well, all tires will have a um, maximum pressure. Never exceed that pressure. There's a reason for it, and you don't wanna find out why, because if that blows up while you're driving, it's gonna be a scary time. Right, hey, let's go and have a look at the tyre pressures on this car. Uh, one thing to note is with the tyre placard, make sure that your tyre size that you've got on your car matches with what's on the uh, ute. If you don't do that, then uh, you could be inflating your tyres to the incorrect pressure, depending on what size you've got. So if you've got a four wheel drive that's got aftermarket tyres on it, they might be a lot bigger. Your pressure requirement's gonna be different. I recommend going to the actual tyre shop you get your tyres from to find out exactly what pressure you require for those tyres. So, checking your tyre pressure. Just put the valve on there and you will have your gauge that you can read your tyre pressure on. And then that basically will determine what pressure you've got in your tyres and this one's correct for this vehicle. If you want to deflate your tyre, if you half press the lever down on one of these, that'll let air out of your tyre slowly 
Then when you push it down all the way, that'll add tire pressure from your compressor into your tire. One thing to do when you're checking your tire pressures as well is also go around all your tires and check and inspect the actual tread wear. Um, make sure that the wear on your tire is even all the way into the inside. So you might have to get underneath your car or jack it up to see on your back wheels. But on your front wheels, you can turn them on full lock and you'll be able to see the inside wear. Some cars, if you've got wear on the inside edge right here or on the outside edge right there, you may need to get an alignment on your vehicle, but also check that the depth is a legal depth. Uh, one good little thing to check is these little uh, notches just there. If you can see that clearly in the camera, there's a little raised lump just there. If your tread gets down to that level, that means your tire is at an illegal level and you need to replace them. If your tire tread at any point across your tire, gets lower than that point it means you need to replace your tire and you also need to get yourself a wheel along when you get a tire change um check that on all your tires as you're doing your tire pressures cool guys i hope that uh this is very informative to you if you're a beginner with automotive or with a car this will be very very helpful for you to keep your car maintained and up to scratch um in between servicing because yeah don't just never open your bonnet when you get your car serviced that's not the only time your car should be checked and looked at you need to be checking your car regularly about once a month. Um, I recommend to my family members, their oil and water, check it once a week because there could be a leak happening in your radiator anywhere that you don't know about that could cost you a lot of money if you're not checking um, inside your, your engine bay on a regular basis. So keep that in mind that one little failure can cost you a lot of money and also just use all these little tips to keep your car on the road. Thanks very much for watching, guys. We'll see you on the next one.